Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's MHTV. Tonight we're lucky to be joined by Andrea Sutcliffe, Chief Executive of the NMC, who you see there in the background, and also Nikki. Um, Nikki is going to be covering social media tonight, so we'll go over to Nikki first of all to um, tell you a little bit about how you can get involved tonight. Hello everyone, really good to be here. Fantastic to have Andrea with us as a guest tonight. Um, if you want to join in, if you have any questions that you'd like to, to ask us, you can do that on Twitter by using the hashtag MHTV, or you can do it on the Facebook Live page. So we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Andrea, um, I think it's quite a few years since I've followed you and you followed me on Twitter. And I think when I first came across you, you uh, were... I always saw you as quite an influencer in social care. And then, of course, you were the um, chief inspector of social care at um, the um, CQC and then on to um, being chief executive at the NMC. So I think it'd be great um, when you introduce yourself tonight, if we can just start really with a little bit about your career and how you ended up at the NMC. And of course, your OBE as well. Congratulations on that. So. Congratulations. Um, well, thank you very much. And thank you so much for having me uh, this evening. I'm really looking forward to this and uh, I'm sure we'll have some fun. Um, so how did I end up at the NMC? I started out in the health service in 19, well, actually a little bit before that, because the first time I worked in the health service, I did a, 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 a holiday job when I was a student as a cleaner. And I have to tell you, if you want to do any role in the health and social care system um, in the future, start as a cleaner. That's absolutely where you know how to how to get things done and what really goes on. Um, but after my university, I joined uh, the health service at a local level, working in finance and business planning and all of those sorts of things, uh, but started managing clinical services, including managing mental health care of older people services in Camden and Islington at one stage. Uh, also managed uh, children and women's services and neurosciences uh, in South London too. And then in 2000, I moved into national roles. So I started off working for what was then the National Institute for Clinical Excellence. Uh, I was their uh, Director of Planning and Resources and eventually Deputy Chief Executive there. And one of the great things about that role was being involved in the development of the guidance and particularly the guidelines in mental health as well as in other areas as well. So I worked with people like uh, Professor Lewis Appleby when he was the... Uh, health star at that stage. Um, and then I moved on into uh, other roles, but including, and I think this is where we first kind of connected, when I was the chief executive of the Social Care Institute yeah. for Excellence. Yeah. So um, that was that was a great opportunity to look at how we could improve um, what was happening in social care. And of course, social care, you know, lots of people just think that that's older people, services and nursing homes and care homes. But as you and I both know, it's much broader than that. And uh, services for people uh, with mental health problems, learning disabilities, really, really important. And then, you know, just the dream job came up at the uh, Policy Commission as the Chief Inspector. And I was, um, I didn't expect to get that job, I have to confess, and uh, was absolutely delighted when I did. Uh, five years there, uh, working very hard to um, uh, improve the system there, to improve what we were doing, and to really put um, uh, the focus on making sure that services in social care were responding to the needs of the people who were using them, and their families, and their carers. Mm. And then you, you kind of get to a stage where you want to be a chief executive. Um, you know, it's um, I like being in charge. Um, and uh, so the role at the Nursing and Midwifery Council came up. And the reason I was attracted to the role for all sorts of different reasons. I've said this to other people before. I can see strands of every single bit of my career ending up in this job. So you know, the work that I did at NICE around standards, we set standards. The work that I did at the Care Quality Commission around uh, you know, um, uh, investigating uh, services when things weren't going badly, obviously kind of fits really well with the regulatory role that we have around fitness to practice. 
the work that I've done around uh, governance and leading organisations, you know, um, when I was at the Social Care Institute for Excellence and the Appointments Commission, again, all of that gave me experience to run an organisation and to help it to develop. So that so it was great from that point of view. I also thought it was a, a role that I could bring something to because at that stage, 2018 was when I was applying for the role. You know, the NMC was in a bit of a difficult situation, lots of challenges facing it at that stage. And I really felt that some of the things that I could bring and the way I wanted to do, uh, to be a chief executive, to be somebody that cared about people, that supported um, my colleagues across the organisation, but also everybody that we worked with in a really inclusive way, felt that that was kind of you know, the energy I could bring into the role I thought um, uh, would be helpful. And then last but not least, who doesn't want to work with nurses and midwives? I mean, come on, you know, the, 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 the most trusted profession um, every year, and it's improving uh, year on year in the Ipsos Mori poll, you know, being involved in things that can be the most joyful moments of people's lives, um, you know, the midwives uh, uh, supporting people through uh, pregnancy and childbirth, but also being there at some of the most difficult moments in their lives. And I think that the work that we can do at the NMC to support our registrants to deliver the safe, kind, effective care that we would all want, you know, ourselves and our loved ones to receive, there's no greater privilege, really. And again, I was so, I mean, I kind of really screamed. Um, unfortunately, I was in a, 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 a railway carriage when I was told that I'd got the job. <laughs> Um, and because I was hiding from my chief executive at the time so that he didn't know. And I was like, you know, jumping up and down and was really excited to be able to get it. And I've loved it ever since. It's got its challenges, but yeah. I love it. I'm sure. I can't believe it's been five years. Did you say five years that you've been there at the NMC? No, no, only two years at the NMC. It doesn't seem like very long at all. Yeah. yeah it's, my, it's my two year anniversary yeah. tomorrow. So this I'm, is my celebratory event for my two year anniversary in the role. Yeah. Well, um, what two years you must have had as well, you know, the pandemic quite soon after you were in post, really. Um, you know, it was really challenging times for the NMC and for the NHS generally. Well, it has been. And I mean, it's kind of, in some ways, what I'm really glad is that I had a year um, of working with my colleagues within the NMC, with our partners across the system, uh, uh, and with registrants and the public. Because I think if I'd kind of started this job uh, in last year's January, it would have been even tougher. But in that first year, there was an awful lot that we did, particularly around looking at what our strategy should be from 2020 through to 2025. And we did a lot of engagement work with people to kind of make that happen which was fantastic and it was really helpful in terms of us being very clear about what we're here to do we're here to regulate you know we don't get to do anything else if we don't deliver on that core function of protecting the public by regulating well so mm -hmm. setting those standards you know maintaining the register supporting revalidation dealing with problems when they arise but we also were very clear that we wanted to do that in a supportive way, you know, and making sure that we were supporting the professionals on the register, as well as supporting the public who come to us and uh, our partners who we work with. And if we regulate well, and if we support people well, then we can use the insight that we get from all of that to influence things. So we can influence, you know, a positive, inclusive environment for people to be working in, for example, bring you know, the insight that we have from our register to bear on issues around um, uh, workforce planning and those sorts of things. So I was really glad that we did that because as you quite rightly say, along with the rest of the health and social care system, 2020, when we thought we were going to be celebrating the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife, it actually did turn into the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife, but in a completely different way because of COVID. And, and actually that work that we've done about what are we here for really helped us to focus what we needed to do in response to the pandemic. So we knew that we needed to make sure that we continue to do our regulatory role well, maintain the register and do what we could to support the development of the register through the temporary register and, and other things. 
but also to make sure that we were supporting our registrants in these incredibly difficult times. So we established the coronavirus hub on the website and you know, within a couple of months, I mean, sort of a million visits, you know, unique visits kind of looking at that and, and, um, and looking at all of the information there, but also making sure that we were using uh, what we were learning from our registrants from what was happening to influence so you know, for example speaking up when there were issues to do with the availability of ppe when we were kind of um, identifying the disproportionate impact of uh, covid on people from black asian and minority ethnic backgrounds including our own registrants so we were able to kind of really articulate what we could do in the pandemic by referring to all of that work that we've done on the strategy. And the other thing that we've done in our, my first year um, was to also think about the values. Mm. You know, the strategy sets out what we do, but our values are really important in saying how we're going to do that. And we wanted our registrants to help inform that. Colleagues across the organization really got involved in thinking through what was important to us as well as listening to the public and our partners. And we come up, I think, with a set of four values, which again have really stood us in good stead in this last year, because they're about being ambitious, ambitious for the organization, ambitious for what nurses, midwives, and nursing associates can do. And uh, you know, so when we were asked with a moment's notice, you, you need to set up a temporary register, we didn't have the power to do that at the beginning of March. We got those powers on the 25th of March when the Act was passed and we opened the temporary register on the 27th. So the ambition that we had to make that work really important. Yeah. The second one was about being fair. And again, we wanted to make sure that in response to the pandemic, we were fair to everybody that we were working with and try to make sure that even though we're still obviously running fitness to practice, that we did that in a way that um, balanced all of the things that we needed to take into consideration in terms of the impact on people. We wanted to be collaborative. That's our third value, you know, working with other people. And boy, have we needed to do that over this last year, both within the organization in terms of all of the different teams working together to provide that support um, out, uh, out with of the uh, NMC, but also with our partners. And Dave, Monday, your kind of you know, person in the background there um, is, is one of those partners, has been in lots of meetings with me over the last year where we've been talking about what we should be doing and how we should be doing it and really working together to try and do, in very difficult circumstances, the right thing. And then lastly, key um, uh, uh, value for us is to be kind. And one of the things that we heard an awful lot of last year was in a world where you can be anything, be kind. And I think that's been so important for everybody during the pandemic in terms of being kind to ourselves, you know, thinking about our health and well-being, being kind to the people that we're working with, understanding the difficult situations that they are in. Because if we can do that, then we can um, instill confidence in the way that the regulator is going to work. Yeah. I mean, kindness is such, um, you know, a small word, isn't it? But it, it's got such a massive meaning. And I think particularly for the NMC to say that that's really important because, you know, as a nurse, of, you know, I qualified in 1996, so quite a long time. Um, apart from registering as a nurse, I can remember back historically when the NMC was somewhere that you registered and you pay your registration, obviously prove you, um, you kept up to date. But then it was also something that you really feared as well, that if you did something wrong, you would be up in front of the NMC, you could lose your registration. And it does feel like there's been a big cultural shift away from that towards kind, towards kind of fitness to practice being um, seen as being um, dealt with more locally. So people, and also I think for me, things like Francis report have influenced it as well in the sense that, I can remember as a lead nurse um, sitting in disciplinaries and, you know, back in the day when the focus was very much on the individual, but now we look more at, much more at the individual and the system that they're operating. So things you talked about with PPE, for example, and actually people being able to speak up and speak out about poor practice and dangerous practice and feels like there's been a big shift there. Well, I think... 
you I mean I'm so glad to hear you say that it feels like that for you too because I mean that's absolutely what we want to achieve and you know, from my point of view we're here to protect the public that's fundamentally the yeah. reason why the agency exists I don't think that we protect the public if we make nearly 725,000, because that's the number of people that are on the register, 725,000 nurses, midwives and nursing associates scared of their regulator. What does that do for your practice? It makes you defensive. It makes you worried. It means that you won't speak up. It means that you won't kind of call out the poor behaviours and all of those sorts of things because you'll be scared about what's going to happen. So, and, and I'm very lucky because I came into the NMC as that shift was already happening and our new fitness to practice strategy was actually agreed in 2018 and was really focused on the saying, it's about ensuring that people are fit to practice. I mean, clearly there are some people who aren't and we are going to, going to have to make those difficult decisions. Yeah. But if even when we do make those difficult decisions, we can do that with kindness. We can do that with respect. We can teach treat people with dignity so that we don't make them feel any, any worse. Mm. But we also need to be thinking exactly as you say, you know, people don't get out of bed in the morning to do bad things. You know, they get out of bed in the morning to do it the best job that they possibly can. What caused that problem on that day? Was that something which was, you know, anybody who had gone into that service on that shift um, in that situation could have made that mistake because the system wasn't set up for them. There weren't enough people um, uh, available to support them. They were being victimised or bullied themselves, um, and uh, or, or whatever the situation may be. And it's really important that we look at that. And even if people do make mistakes, and they are genuine mistakes which they need to kind of learn from, actually, yeah. if they've got insight, if they've taken the time and the effort to kind of put that right, then yeah. actually. I think there's a real case to say you you are still fit to practice. Um, yeah. We're not about punishment. We're about making sure that people are capable of doing the job, meeting the standards and abiding by the code of conduct that we've got. Yeah, it's a really good message, isn't it? Yeah, Nikki, um, just wonder yeah. if you want to go over to you at this point. Yeah, we are getting questions. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, particularly to a uh, Facebook group who are very lively. Um, so, um, well, question a, from ha- <laughs> a question from Hazel McPherson. What opportunities do you see for the NMC to help strengthen the visibility of mental health and learning disability nurses within the wider health and social care system? And a couple of people have wanted to have that expanded on. So, I, I think it's really important. I mean, we've got... Um, I wrote it down so that I didn't get it wrong. 90,203 mental health nurses um, on the register and 17,179 learning disability nurses on the register. Now, the numbers in mental health are sort of slightly creeping up. Uh, The numbers in learning disabilities um, have increased a little bit in the last year, but have not made up the losses that we've seen over the last five to 10 years. So I think there's the, the first and most important part is for us to be promoting learning disabilities and mental health nurses as um, absolutely critical parts of um, the professional nursing community. They, you, you abide by the same code of conduct as everybody else. You've got to meet the same standards. There's absolutely no reason why there should be a stigma or anything like that attached to the role of a mental health nurse or a learned disability nurse. And you know, I know lots of them, and they're fabulous, and they save lives. You know, undoubtedly, you know, nurses in these areas save lives just as much as anybody in an intensive care unit does. So we need to be very positive about that contribution. But more than that, it's the kind of holistic way that learning disability nurses and mental health nurses go about the role that you have. You know, seeing the whole person, 
and actually working with um, uh, individuals and working with, you know, where that's appropriate with their families, with their extended um, uh, friendship groups and the rest, because, you know, people's mental health, you know, isn't an isolated thing. It is impacted on all of, by all of those different things. So I think one of the other fantastic skills that I think learning disability and mental health nurses have is that collaborative working, working across the boundaries, working with others. And again, I think that there's lots that others could, could learn from, from uh, uh, nurses from these branches uh, uh, of the, these fields of practice. So in terms of what we can do from um, the Nursing Midwifery Council, we can say those things, we can be clear about that, we can actually be positive about the contribution and, and talk about it. And I do talk about it and I do talk about how important these roles are. Uh, I've done visits when I could do visits, I'm so missing doing visits. Um, when I did visits, you know, I did visits to um, services where I was meeting mental health nurses, where I was meeting learned disability uh, nurses, talked about those things. Um, one of the things that I need to do within the NMC is to make sure that you, we understand, you know, I've got nearly a thousand staff working um, at the NMC and lots of them won't really understand all of the different areas because, you know, they're doing all sorts of different jobs. And one of the things that we are doing within the NMC is trying to make sure that all of our colleagues really understand the different branches of, um, mm -hmm. of the work that we do. So tomorrow we're having um, an internal webinar where we've got um, a, a couple of mental health nurses and a learned disability nurse who are going to be talking about their experiences of the pandemic, how they've been working over the last year so that I can share that information because it's all well and good me doing it, but I need to make sure that all of my colleagues mm. are in a position to be able to talk confidently about the positive contribution that mental health and learning disability mm make absolutely i think it's one of those things as a, as a mental health nurse for 20 years i roll my eyes i love being a nurse i'm from a family of nurses i love it but when i see us represented i i rarely see or get a feel that mental health and learning disability nurses are images even when you look at stock images anything that we just don't seem to be that visible that said we've got some more people on, on facebook okay um, thank you Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joanne. Um, I wonder if um, you'd like to be a guest in the future yourself. Um, talking about the work that um, uh, her organisation is doing with um, early career learning disability and mental health nurses with development programmes, and that's key, obviously, really important. Um, mm -hmm. And then another, uh, uh, Charlie, is talking about um, what can we do to make or help and support nurses to be more visible and nursing to be more visible? Because I think, as you rightly said, we were all set up, weren't we, for the year of the nurse and the midwife, and then it was... Um, yeah. The year of us all sharing that space with COVID. <laughs> it's a bit different. And whilst I think we missed out, I mean, because clearly we did, there was all sorts of things that people were going to be doing uh, last year, which we've not been able to do. There are some real um, positives that we can take from the last year in terms of the recognition of the importance of nursing um, and, and particularly in mental health and learned disabilities. So um, one of the things that we, we know, and uh, this has been shown both by the data from the Care Quality Commission, but also ONS, that uh, learning disability, the people with learning disabilities um, have been disproportionately affected by COVID. And, uh, and when you listen to the testimony of, of some of those people and you understand why that has happened, you can absolutely see what a critical role learning disability nurses have. So one of the things was we didn't know what the rules were. Everything kept on changing and we didn't have the support to be able to actually um, look after ourselves, take care of ourselves and be safe. Well, you know, you guys have got the skills to be able to share and support um, uh, with people who are in those vulnerable circumstances, you know, what they need to do and to do that in a way that they understand and can uh, and can relate to, as opposed to, you know, even the easy read documents that um, yeah. uh, governments put out are not necessarily that easy. And so having somebody in your roles who can support people in the community in those ways, absolutely critical. And from a mental health perspective, <clears throat> what I can see in all sorts of different ways is how this last year has really impacted 
on the mental health and well-being of the population as a whole. It's also impacted on our, the professionals on our register, which is a, another topic of conversation too. But particularly if we're looking about um, the impact on, on the community. And I was talking to some nurses in um, Cornwall this morning, and they were saying that whilst they hadn't necessarily seen an increase in referrals, they'd seen an increase in acuity. Mm -hmm. and that people are much you know, iller um, mm -hmm. and in a greater level of crisis um, uh, in terms of when they're presenting uh, into services. So again, I think that um, whilst an awful lot of the focus, in particular at the moment in terms of the, this, this awful um, crisis that we're in at the mm -hmm. moment, pandemic a lot of the focus is on what's happening from the intensive care unit point of view mm -hmm. from the acute post hospital point of view i can also see the massive impact that it's had on mental health and um, yeah. this is going to i think push both learning disability nurses and mental health nurses into the floor because you are going to be needed like you've never been needed before mm -hmm. so in a way whilst none of us would want this to be the case there is an opportunity to really demonstrate the value and the contribution that learning disability and mental health nurses can make. And we all collectively need to be doing that. Mm. Yeah. Thank well, you very much. Yeah, I think as well, um, you know, as the pandemic lifts, when it eventually does lift and life goes back to the new normal, I think that's when mental health nurses are going to be needed the most, isn't it? So you know, I hope that there'll be some recognition of that within the system that as people start to kind of get on with life and, you know, forget about um, what's happened, that um, it's recognised that people's mental health needs are going to be ongoing. Because I would say that um, in the last year of doing MHTV, one of the most consistent themes that we've had has been about trauma, hasn't it, yeah. Nikki? You know, that's yeah. hearing over and over again. So hopefully yeah. some Mission of that, and also that you know, nurses, mental health nurses, and other nurses are trained in trauma because it's not um, a core part of our role, but it's going to be a skill that we're going to need. And um, especially, I would say, adult nurses. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're having that conversation. I think in mental health and learning disability quite a lot, but maybe it's not something that's gone mainstream. I've, I've just got one more come from WhatsApp, which I think is, is part of the beauty of, of social media. It just says, <laughs> it just says. Workforce planning and then three crying emoticons. So I'm that's, guessing that's a, a plea for more yeah. staff, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Has anyone got any thoughts on that? Um, I mean, absolutely. So, and I mentioned the numbers earlier in terms of the numbers uh, of mental health and learning disability nurses. So addressing learning disability nurses first, we absolutely need more. There's just no two ways about it. And we need to be encouraging people uh, into the courses and we need to be making sure that they've got really good opportunities to go into. Now, the role of the NMC is not to make those um, uh, uh, you know, make those opportunities available. We're not people's employers or any, any of those sorts of things. But what we can do is um, to, to help support that process and to identify that those are the issues that people need to be addressing. Similarly for mental health, you know, it is creeping up, but I think Vanessa, you're spot on. We're going to need more people in the future and we need to be making sure um, uh, that that is happening. What can the NMC do? So there's a couple of things that I think that we can do. And the first is around our role, around setting standards, um, encouraging uh, the uh, uh, people to see this as a really important uh, area of practice to come into and to support that, working with the uh, approved education institutions in terms of quality assuring what they're doing and ensuring that they are delivering great courses that attract people and uh, deliver us fantastic nurses for the future. The second thing that we can do is also, you remember I kind of said, we said we're here to regulate, we're here to support, we're here to influence. And I think that part of the influencing is using the data and the information that we've got. So one of the things that we do on an annual basis is ask people why they leave. Um, why have they left the register? Now, you know, as I'm sure you can imagine, the highest reason is retirement. But after that, the reasons are very much linked to the impact on people of um, stress um, and uh, work-related work stress, 
not being able to deliver the quality of care that they would want to, uh, those sorts of things. And I think what we need to do, and we have done over the last year, is share that information with the policymakers, with the people who are kind of you know, giving out the, uh, the money as to where it should go in these areas and say, these are issues that you've got to address. You know, it's really important to uh, focus on the recruitment of nurses, to focus on the training, but it's also really, really important for us to focus on the retention. Because if we were able to keep all the people who, who, who at the moment leave prematurely, you know, we would be able to actually have an awful lot people, more people working in the service. So identifying that this is a theme that's coming out of our leavers survey, I think is really important. So, you know, we don't have the levers to pull that say, and here's the money and there you go, or, you know, um, uh, chief executive of this trust, this is what we need to do to do um, uh, to do that. But what we can do is use the insight that we've got from our work uh, to influence that. Thank you. Yeah. And what about, um, you know, a lot of the nurses who are returning as part of the pandemic? Um, I'm not sure where that came from, that noise, but anyway, awesome. a lot of the... Um, <laughs> It's not mine either, but um, yeah, um, lost my thread. Yeah, I was thinking in terms of like we've got a lot of nurses who are returning to practice as part of um, the sort of COVID response and obviously recruitment from overseas. Is there any indication yet that um, some of those nurses are likely to carry on and stay in practice? Um, is that I'm quite in, yeah. It's an interesting yes, one. And it, and it has happened, for Vanessa, it has happened. So in the in the first wave, we had, at the height of the, um, uh, of the te temporary register, we had about 14,000 people on the temporary register. That yeah. has dropped because um, uh, a, a couple of thousand have actually moved on to the permanent register. Now, the vast majority of those were overseas applicants um, who uh, you know, went onto the temporary register in the first instance because they couldn't sit their OSCEs because um, the, the centres were closed at that stage. And many of them you know, uh, were supported to move onto the permanent register once we'd opened those centres. But we have had a number of the temporary registrants uh, uh, move onto the permanent register and others say that they would like to in the future too. So one of the things that I'm saying back into the service as well is we still got a number of people on the temporary register who haven't been used yet. And there's there's still a need for them to be used because I think there's we've still got some folk there who if we get them back and get them energized and get them kind of excited about what's possible and what they can do and the contribution that they can make, perhaps some of the reasons why they left in the first place, you know, will, will have been addressed and so we can keep them for the future. Yeah, yeah, that sounds really positive. I totally agree. Um, you know, you, you've said throughout really about kind of asking people about being collaborative and it's really important, isn't it? Because I've often, in terms of workforce strategy, that the people who look at workforce strategy might be um, people who really have the answers to the workforce issues. So, for example, asking an older person how we're going to recruit younger generation nurses when there's a constant sort of mind shift about what people want. You know, mm. you know, back in the day, people were looking for, you know, grades and status. And, you know, a lot of young people now are looking for flexibility and, and variety, aren't they? So I think, you know, being more flexible about mm. career pathways and opportunities for nurses as well is, is part of the way forward too. Absolutely. And, you know, in, to my mind, there is no more flexible uh, an occupation than being a nurse in terms yeah. of all the different ways that you can actually, you know, practice. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, as a mental health nurse, you can be you know, doing acute liaison, you can be in an emergency department, you can be out in the community, you can be working in, in a prison, you, you know, a whole host of different things that people can do. So, you know, there is flexibility and that whole idea that you start your career with a kind of, you know, I'm going in this direction and this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to tick all of these things up along the way. Not really the way that it works anymore. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I think that nursing can give you a real variety and we need to be demonstrating that to people. We need to be demonstrating that this is a career which can give you fabulous opportunities if promotion and development is what you want, it can give you <clears throat> fabulous opportunities in terms of different things to do. What I think the service 
uh, in, in all of its um, uh, different guises needs to respond to, though, is that requirement for flexibility in the, in the way that people live their lives. Yeah. Because that I think, you know, particularly with younger generation, and it's not just about, you know, women wanted to have babies and sort of manage all of those different things. Yeah whole host of different reasons why people want to have flexibility in the way that they live their lives. They may have caring responsibilities for um, uh, for, for uh, elderly parents, or they might have, uh, you know, actually an awful lot of learning disability nurses I know. The reason why they're a learning disability nurse is because somebody in their family has got yeah. a learning disability. Yeah. 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 They may have that caring responsibility as well. So just being able to respond to that in terms of how we organise things and how we support people. Because, you know, one of the things that um, I have to confess drives me to distraction is that we get people going, well, you know, I, I've asked for flexible shifts in this way or the other because that would help me in terms of the way that I'm managing my life. And, and the, and the organisation said, no, no, we can't do that. So then they go off and work on the bank or the agency. And guess what? They're doing the shift that they said that they wanted to do. But um, the organisation is paying twice the money for it. So we need to kind of think about how can we sort of use some of this. And there's lots of places where that innovation is happening now. And I think that, you know, there's some great places where you know, um, we can learn from in terms of how you, you do flexible working and, and we can also look overseas I mean look at the Birdsog model in terms of self-managed teams mm -hmm. and the things. Yeah. you know what 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 are the opportunities that we can really pick up on and given that we've now over this last year really learned how to do this on a flexible remote working basis yeah absolutely what mm. can we use from that yeah. to help us in the future yeah Totally. I mean, digital needs to be reflected, doesn't it, in um, nursing standards in the future for definite. Um, because, mm. you know, one of the positives, hopefully, from from this will be that people will be working in, in different ways, digital, yeah. in you know, more digitally enabled ways, which, you know, is a positive. I know we all complain about, you know, how many Zooms we have to do and, you know, how we'd like to meet face to face. But in the future, you know, we are all going to be more skilled up in those areas, aren't we? And it's going to offer so much more in terms of patient care. And um, and particularly, yeah, when we look at the changing profile of people and the, you know, five year forward view and the people plan and things and the sort of need. And yeah. I, think, I think it can be more inclusive because one of, mm. one of the things that I was hearing from Cornwall this morning was that for, uh, and this was particularly in the midwifery service, but it was also something that they were talking about in, in other services too, was that they've had colleagues who were uh, self-isolating or, yeah. or, or shielding, but they've used those colleagues to do the triaging and to do the telephone conversations, particularly with women who were isolated, who were in vulnerable circumstances, and weren't getting the support networks that might have been previously available. But actually, so that what that made me think is I bet there's a whole bunch of people who could have those those skill, those nursing skills, but um, because of a disability or or, or, or impairment of, of, of whatever kind, you know, wouldn't want to be going out there sort of, you know, um, uh, you walk in the streets uh, and delivering care. But actually they could do it in this way. Wouldn't that be brilliant? Yeah, yeah, and would help with some of the workforce issues as well. So, yeah, that'd be great. So, as one um, conscious that we we've, we've only got about six minutes or so left, haven't we, Nikki? So, I'm just yeah. wondering, Nikki, if you any questions? Um, yeah, there's a couple of things coming through, and if the answer is you don't know, we haven't got that information yet. Please just say because I'm getting the same question over and over again um, on um, a review of standards. Um, is there anything, any news on a timeline for program length, pre-registration, practice hour simulation? Um, that's coming from Ben and from Adam and, and a couple of other people. Um, and the other, uh, another person who's commenting is a person talking, uh, Charlie, talking about is there more that the NMC can do to support the well-being of, of um, students on nursing programmes and as newly qualified um, staff? So it's again that idea about retaining staff. Yeah. So on on, on the standards, uh, we are <clears throat> we've we've started some. Um, research to look at what we might need to do around this. So uh, for the, the kind of, you know, just to do the tiny little technical bit of this is that our standards um, were based on the European Union directive, which kind of sets you know, various aspects of, of what we need to do. 
might have might have kind of noticed that we sort of you know Brexit has happened. And so um we what we want to do though is not to say that's all rubbish and we're going to get rid of it and just move on. Um, what we want to do is to look at the evidence base as to what really is the right and proper thing to do. How can we use simulation better? Because, I mean, actually, it's a bit old-fashioned as it stands at the moment. You know, what 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 really constitutes um, a, a proper kind of learning um, uh, programme uh, around hours and all of those sorts of things. So we've commissioned some research, um, which might, hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping, will be able to give us some earlier answers on, on, on simulation, but more considered answers um, uh, further down the line uh, along things like um, uh, length and uh, hours, uh, Nikki. So that work is in hand and you know, please keep an eye on the NMC website to, to have a look at that. In terms of supporting people in terms of uh, their well-being and, uh, and, and, and all of that, I'll just highlight a couple of things just to make sure that if there's any, any final um, question that people want to come in. The first is that uh, is the, the importance of that first year when you're newly qualified and ensuring that people get the preceptorship support that they absolutely need to make sure that they have the best possible experience. Because if they have a good experience, then we're going to keep them for life. But if you yeah. have bad experience then, then actually, you know, you may not leave in that first year, but that bad experience will actually potentially mean that you leave earlier than you would have done. So last year, we um, <clears throat> published uh, standards for preceptorship. Um, and now the difficult thing for the NMC is we're a professional regulator, we can hold the professionals to account, we can't hold the the employers to account. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to do is to make it absolutely crystal clear what we thought the right and proper way of going about this was. And my hope and expectation is that other organisations like the Care Quality Commission, when they are assessing organisations, would be asking those questions because you know they should be asking the question when they're saying, is a service well led? You know, is that service spending its time providing the support for newly qualified nurses in the way that it should. So that's the first thing, and that's using our influence. The second thing is about us providing supportive materials. So the, the, the one that I would just kind of point people's attention to at the moment is we did a little series of uh, um, animated videos last towards the end of last year called Caring with Confidence. And what they were all about was taking bite-sized chunks of the code and kind of you know, bringing them across uh, in a lively and an interesting way. And it really is bite-sized. So I don't think any one of those videos is, is more than two and a half minutes long. But it just gives you something to think about, something to talk about with your team or you know, for students in, in, in a lecture um, or in a, in, a, in, a, in a peer group uh, with, with um, others just to think, well, actually, what's this saying to me? What can I do with this? How can the code support me in the work that I do so that I can truly care with confidence? And I'd really like to see us at the NMC doing more of those things uh, in and in those different ways. You know, an animated video won't be for everybody, but it will be for some people. And it has been very, very positively received, particularly by students, actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they are great. I really like them. <laughs> That's the kind of feedback we like. <laughs> Probably yeah. should have mentioned it earlier. I'd forgotten about them, but I did love them and I retweeted them. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nikki. I love you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is that it, Nikki, with questions so far? Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I've just been thanking people for yeah. joining in. And anybody, if you are putting questions on, we will be circling back over the next couple of days. So don't worry, we'll, we'll either answer them ourselves or redirect them. So please feel free to, to carry on chatting. If we're going to be finishing up you don't have to yeah thank you yeah so we're, we're coming to the end now um as nikki says if we've um if we've not answered any of your questions or you think about something afterwards you know do tweet us or comment on the facebook page and we'll we'll get back to you so we'll um we'll go over to andrew if that's okay just for any um any final thoughts um before we end tonight 
So I would just like to say, um, I've loved this conversation. As you could probably tell, I can talk from Britain about all of this stuff. Um, and it's been really great. And thank you to um, Vanessa and to Nikki uh, for being such congenial hosts. Thank you very much. You. And, uh, and to Dave for all of the kind of you know, stuff going on in the background, um, which people can't see, but is really very important. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and, and also thank you to everybody who's uh, watched and sent in questions. And I'd just like to end with a couple of points. The first is to say, you know, I really do know how important mental health nurses and indeed learning disability nurses um, are. You know, I, I come from a family that has um, the experience of mental health problems and I have been bereaved by suicide um, because that's how my brother died um, in 2006. And whilst that was an incredibly sad um, outcome, I also know that the support that he had from nurses um, in the last 11 years of his life were really very, very important. So um, when I say that I know that mental health nurses and learning disability nurses matter and they make a huge contribution, I'm not saying that for show. I really mean it because I know that you do. And that leads me to my final point, which is to say thank you for everything that you do do. It means so much to the people that you support and it means so much to their families as well and it has a lasting impact. So thank you, and thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to be here this evening. There's all sorts of things that I've written about uh, in blogs on the NMC website where you can kind of see other things, um, including my thoughts about mental health and uh, uh, mental health nurses and supporting the health and well-being of nurses. So please take a look at those things uh, if you would be um, uh, interested. But it's been an absolute delight this evening. Um, it's been a tough day today for all sorts of reasons, but this has been lovely. So thank you very, very much. Yeah, and thank you. We really appreciate it. And thank you yeah. for being candid. And I'm sure, you know, on your, your point about your, your loss of your brother, you mm -hmm. know, it, it can massive difference just that you're able to, you know, talk about it. And hopefully it encourages other people to open up and talk about suicide as well, which is, you know, an enormous thing as well. So thank you for that as well. Thank um, you. Yeah. And I think that's it from us, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, Good night, all. Yeah. Thank Good night. you. Take care. Bye. Thank you.